Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. This video is going to focus on bacteria, our friends, the prokaryotes. If you remember in nature, you have two types of cells. You have what we call prokaryotes and you have what we call eukaryotes. And prokaryotes are basically cells that do not have a nucleus protecting their DNA, while eukaryotes do. So in the classification system, when I was in high school, there were only five kingdoms. You had kingdom Monera, which was basically where you had all of your bacteria. Well, kingdom Monera doesn't exist anymore. It has been divided into two kingdoms of prokaryotes, and that is what this video today is going to focus on. So if you remember, in the case of bacteria, that means that you have no nucleus protecting your DNA. And remember, I always consider the nucleus to be like the safe. You have a safe to protect your valuables. Well, one of the most important things you have in your cell is your DNA. It is the cookbook that holds all the recipes that you're ever going to need for your cells to do all the jobs that they need to do. And that's what your genes are. So genes are recipes that tell our bodies how to make proteins. And so in the case of eukaryotes, they're more advanced than prokaryotes. It's believed that prokaryotes formed first um, in evolution because they're very basic. They don't have all those different organelles. They have ribosomes. We talked about that's one thing that cells have to have because they have to make proteins. And they have one piece of DNA and it's always in a circle. And that piece of DNA is their genetic material. But they don't have a nucleus to protect their DNA like we do. This is why bacteria can mutate so quickly because their DNA is more susceptible to different changes that it has. But like I mentioned, when I was growing up, there was only five kingdoms. We had kingdom Monera. And so sometimes you'll hear bacteria still called Monerans. But now we have the technology and we're able to discover that there was one thing that some bacteria had that other bacteria didn't have. And that was enough to take kingdom Monera and divide it into two different kingdoms. So the first group is what's called kingdom Archaebacteria. And the root word Archae means that it is ancient. It means that it is probably been around for many, 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 many years. Yeah, I'm still at school, as you can hear. But in the case of Archaebacteria, we don't think that these have changed since they began. Archaebacteria is actually the group that we think came first in evolution. And the Archaebacteria that still exist here on Earth live in what are called extreme environments. These are environments where not a lot of other things live. It's remember when the earth first formed, it was not anything like we know today. The oceans that the earth first had probably didn't have the salt water in it like we had. The atmosphere wasn't anything like our atmosphere. It didn't have oxygen um, like we know it. We had to have plants to get oxygen or autotrophs to have oxygen. And so there are some areas on earth that haven't really changed that much over time. And that's where we find these types of bacteria. So for example, one type of archaeobacteria are called methanogens, and these are anaerobic creatures. Remember, anaerobes mean that they don't use oxygen. And these are probably some of the first, or descendants of some of the first cells that we had in nature, because when the earth first formed, it's believed it didn't have oxygen. A lot of what we know from studying the earth comes from studying volcanic explosions, and we know what kind of gases are given off in, in volcanic explosions, and so it's assumed that when the Earth first formed, the atmosphere would be very similar to those gases that are given off in these explosions. And there's no oxygen there. And in the case of methanogens, these guys, you might have heard of swamp lights or swamp gas. Well, a lot of methanogens live in marshes or swamps. Marshes and swamps are watery areas, but they don't have like strong currents. So the water doesn't move around a lot. So it becomes stagnant and a lot of the dead stuff just sinks to the bottom. So there's not a lot of fish in some marshes, not a lot of um, are in swamps because the oxygen levels in these water are very low. You guys know you can take a water bottle and shake it up and you get bubbles in it. Well, that's because the water is moving that helps create oxygen. Well, in swamps and marshes, you don't have that. And a lot of these bacteria live down in these swamps and marshes. And a lot of them are decomposers because all this dead stuff sinks to the bottom and they will help break that down. It's also found in digestive tracts of certain animals and we use them in sewage treatment plants. Now, obviously a sewage treatment plant is not natural, so these guys aren't man-made, but out where I live, um, Johnson County, 
we have a septic tank. Now, usually with you guys, if you live in the city of Raleigh, when you flush the toilet or you turn the faucet on, water goes down the drain, and then it goes through a series of pipes to a water treatment plant. Well, in my house, when you flush the toilet or put water down the drain, it goes to a big cement tank in my backyard. And that's what a septic tank is. And you might have seen commercials for something called Red-X, where Red-X is kind of like archaea bacteria. And you have to sprinkle this into your septic tank every so often. And it kind of wakes these guys up and they begin to eat the waste products. Well, instead of using chemicals to recycle our water, a natural bacteria can actually break down a waste products such as toilet paper or fecal material. So a lot of waste treatment plants now are trying to move towards using this type of bacteria instead of using expensive or even harmful chemicals. Another type, like I was mentioning, what are called halophiles. Okay. Halophiles live in salty places. Now, if you know your root, for, root words, the root word file, phil, P-H-I, like Philadelphia, that means to like or to love. These guys love salt water. And most creatures, you guys know, salt water will dehydrate. Well, this special type of bacteria has a really nice thick cell wall, and most bacteria have cell walls, which is why when they were first discovered, a lot of times they were classified as, as algae, which was classified as plants, but algae and plants are not the same thing. But these guys live in incredibly salty places where other creatures aren't gonna live, like the Great Salt Lakes in Utah or the Dead Sea. The reason it's called the Dead Sea is because not a lot of stuff can live in it because it's so salty. But you know, when the world first formed, the oceans that we had were probably a lot saltier than they are now because things are, that's when our oceans first formed, they were probably fresh water. But over time with the tides and the currents, erosion has happened. And so salt has built up in the water. Well, you guys know salt sinks. So it gets saltier as you go down. And so this type of bacteria can live in those extreme salty environments where you're not gonna have other forms of life. Now, some of them thermophiles live in really, really hot water. And this picture here is actually taken at Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone National Park. And you can see the water vents. The crust at Mammoth Hot Springs in Yellowstone National Park is very, very, very thin. They tell you there's certain areas you can't walk on because literally if you fall through the crust, you will end up in boiling water. And there's been cases where people have fallen through and never to be found again. But you can see the thermo, uh, the vents where this hot water is coming up um, from the ground. And you can see in the picture around it, this yellowish color, that's sulfur. A lot of sulfur comes up to the surface. And this type of bacteria, and so if you, if you go to Mammoth Hot Springs, it smells like rotten eggs. Well, that's the sulfur that you're smelling. Well, this bacteria lives in that hot water. And a lot of them can do what's called chemosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis makes sugar using light. Chemosynthesis makes sugar using chemicals. And a lot of these creatures can do chemosynthesis using sulfur. So they've adapted, they have very nice thick cell walls. They've adapted to this hot water and they're living off the sulfur that comes up. We also find a lot of thermophiles down in the deepest part of the ocean at along what we call the rifts. So the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger. They have what's called the Great Atlantic Rift running right up the middle. So hot magma, which is like lava, is coming to the surface and it hits that, sea, that, that cold seawater and it hardens and that's what's forming crust. So our Atlantic Ocean is spreading. So there's areas of very, very hot water and these types of bacteria are being found in that area. But when you think of bacteria, the type that you are thinking of is what's called eubacteria. So what you think of is eubacteria. Archaeobacteria is probably something you're not gonna come in contact with unless you work at a sewage treatment plant or you go deep, 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 deep sea diving or you happen to scoop up some water at a hot springs. Most of the bacteria you think of, it belongs to this group. It's what we call everyday bacteria. They can live pretty much anywhere. You have bacteria on your skin right now. You have bacteria in your hair. There's bacteria all over everything. And not all bacteria are bad. When people tend to think of bacteria, they're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna make me sick. Well, this is how sourdough bread gets made. For those of you who know sourdough bread, um, the bread has a bacteria in it and the bacteria gives off a waste product, which is an acid that makes it sour. Um, a lot of, this is how Swiss cheese gets made. This bacteria 
uh, and yeast get added to the cream and the bacteria give off gaseous waste products and that's what forms the holes in the Swiss cheese. So not all bacteria is bad, but unfortunately a lot of it is and it kind of gets a bad rep. Now in the case of bacteria, when I say bacteria, I'm specifically talking about eubacteria. If I'm gonna talk about archaeobacteria, I will say archaeobacteria. But in the case of eubacteria, they can be heterotrophs. Remember, if you're heterotrophic, that means that you have to feed off of something. So they might be parasites, they might be decomposers, but parasites obviously would be like a bad bacteria. That would be the bacteria that, that can make you sick, like streptococcal pneumonia, which causes pneumonia, or what you call strep throat. Um, that's a bacteria. So staph infections, okay? These are parasites. They basically attack our cells and they cause damage to our cells. And that's what makes us sick. When you're sick, you have cells that are being damaged. You have cells that are being killed by the virus, the bacteria, whatever it might be. But some bacteria are good. Like it says here, they can be decomposers. Imagine what the world would be like if we didn't have decomposers. Decomposers like bacteria, different types of bugs, um, fungus. We would have thousands of years of dead stuff just stacked on top of each other. So with heterotrophs, they have to feed off of something. So there are parasites. Those are the bad bacteria you think of. But some of them are decomposers. They're going to help break down things. Now, some of them are autotrophs. What you're seeing in this picture, a lot of people would say was algae or pond scum, when in reality, it's billions and billions and billions of these little microscopic bacteria forming this greenish color. And it's actually what's called cyanobacteria, or for years, it was called blue-green algae because people thought it was algae. It had a cell wall. It was unicellular. But come to find out, algae has a nucleus, and these guys don't. So some bacteria are autotrophs. Okay? They can obviously do photosynthesis. Okay? And like this blue-green bacteria here, which a lot of people call pond scum. But like I mentioned, some can do chemosynthesis, like the thermophiles that live in the hot springs. They still make sugar and other organic molecules, but they use things like sulfur or different chemicals, different elements in order for this to happen. Now, let's take a look at what a bacterium is. Now, bacteria is plural um, for my Latin people. Bacterium is singular. And so bacteria come in all different shapes and sizes, but to be a bacteria, remember structure determines function. So if you're a bacteria, you're gonna have specific parts to you. It is a cell, so it has a plasma membrane. It has cytoplasm but it has DNA, but remember, it does not have a nucleus protecting its DNA. That's what makes eukaryotes eukaryotes and prokaryotes prokaryotes. So they don't have a lot of membrane-bound organelles. They're not gonna have a Golgi body. They're not gonna have endoplasm reticulum. They do have ribosomes because they have to make proteins. And again, their DNA is often, they have one piece of DNA and it's often in a circle. Now it might be twisted up to look like a bowl of spaghetti, if you could unwind it, it would actually be one circle. And a lot of times this is called a plasmid. Like I mentioned, it does have a cell wall. Okay. Now, a lot of bacteria, when bacteria first formed, they probably formed in water. And a lot of bacteria still lives in moist environments. And so we've talked about osmosis and diffusion. And so the cell wall is impermeable. Remember, that means things can't easily pass back and forth. And so if the bacteria is aquatic, the cell wall helps water helps stop water from rushing in and this cell exploding. That's how antibiotics work. Antibiotics have a B in them. Antibiotics are for bacteria. And antibiotics, a lot of them are actually made from fungi. Um, fungi have a chemical that destroys bacteria. And I don't know who thought of this, but you know, back in the mid middle even uh, middle even, medieval times, if I can talk people would take moldy bread and put it on a really bad wound to keep it from getting infected. That's because the fungi, chemicals that the fungi make naturally kill bacteria. So when you take something like penicillin or amoxicillin or different antibiotics that they have out there, what it is is the chemical actually eats holes in the cell wall. It basically punches holes in that cell wall and then water rushes into the bacteria and the bacteria swells up and explodes. So that's how those drugs kill bacteria. Now, some bacteria have like a sticky um, mucus around them. It's what's called a capsule. And we can actually judge bacteria based on how thick their capsule is, which we're gonna talk about in a second. But in this picture here, you'll see, it looks like it has lots of hairs. Well, a lot of bacteria have this one flagella 
which you guys know is a whip that we used to move. And these hairs look like cilia, but these hairs are called pili, P-I-L-I. And what a lot of um, bacteria will have will look fuzzy. Well, these little pili can kind of act like Velcro, and it helps them stick to whatever cell that they are trying to attack or trying to infect or trying to feed off of. So speaking of the capsule, the thicker the capsule, the more dangerous the bacteria is because the capsule is like a protective layer of mucus. So if a bacteria has a thick capsule around it, it's harder for our bodies to kill off that bacteria or it's harder for chemicals to get to the bacteria cell walls to punch those holes in them. And we can do something that's called gram staining and gram staining tells us about the cell wall. And hold on one second. Now, one of the reasons that we had to take archaeobacteria and separate it from eubacteria is the fact that eubacteria were discovered to have a protein in their cell wall, um, a substance in their cell wall that archaeobacteria didn't have. And that substance is something called peptidoglycan. It's a protein sugar mixture that is found in the cell walls of some bacteria. And that bacteria, that discovery was enough to take archaeobacteria and split it from eubacteria. Eubacteria have this peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Well, gram staining is where we literally stain bacteria in order to look at them. And when they were staining it, there was a reaction. And it was later discovered that the gram staining lets you have an idea of how thick that mucus layer or how thick the cell wall of that bacteria is. Now, the gram stain reacts with peptidoglycan. So if you have what we call gram positive, okay, gram positive, it stains purple and gram negative is going to stain pink. Well, purple is positive and positive means it's a good thing. Pink is red and red means no bad stop, all that stuff. Bacteria that are gram positive do not have a lot of peptidoglycan. So therefore, if you are gram positive, it allows you to, um, excuse me, it, it does have it does have a lot of peptidoglycan, but it, the reason it's positive is because if you have to have a bacteria, this is the type of bacteria you want to have. Because this, the way that the cell wall is composed, it's easy for chemicals like antibiotics to get through there in order to kill the bacteria. The more dangerous bacteria are your gram-negative bacteria. And with the way that their cell walls are made, it's very hard to get these chemicals through in order to destroy the bacteria. So when you're doing your pathogen wanted poster project, it's coming. When you're researching, some of you will have bacteria, some of you will have viruses. If it has a plus next to it, that means that it is a positive, gram positive. And if it has a negative, it means it's a gram negative. Now, with bacteria, we often name bacteria according to their shapes. And so, some bacteria are round, they're what we call cosi bacteria. Some bacteria look like you're taking an aspirin. Um, they're bacillus, and then some bacteria look like spirals. So obviously, they're called spirulium. So a lot of times when you look at the name of a bacteria, it might have some of these terms listed, like staphylococcus bacteria. That lets you know, oh, it's round. Or um, staphylobacillus. Okay, it's long. it kind of looks like a Tylenol. But one of the ways, a fast, easy way of taking all the bacteria in nature and dividing them into different groups is by looking at their shape. We can also look to see, do they stay by themselves or do they form groups? So you guys know the root word di means two. So diploid would mean that they form pairs, like you're seeing here. Staphylo means that they're gonna form a cluster and strepto means that they form chains. So like you've all heard of strep throat before. Well, strep throat lets you know it's a bacteria and they all line up like that. You might have heard of staph infections. Well, staph infections, like the flesh-eating bacteria, staph infections are bacteria that tend to live in clusters. Everybody likes to have a partner. Everybody likes to have friends. So a lot of times bacteria will form groups. They'll pair up. 
Um, it's probably an evolutionary adaptation. Um, they can help each other find their food source, or whatever it is that they're looking for. So again, when we name bacteria, they're named according to their growth pattern. So is it diplo, staphylo, or strepto? And then their shape. So, but not all bacteria will have these terms in their names. Right? Some bacteria are named after the region they're found. Some bacteria are named after whatever disease or whatever they do. Some bacteria are named after the person. Okay? But sometimes you'll see like Staphylococcus. That lets you know that it's a round bacteria that tends to form groups or clusters. Now, bacteria obviously make more, but they make more through something called binary fission. Bi meaning two. Fission means to split. So binary fission basically means it splits in half. But we have to do DNA replication because we both of the baby bacteria are twins. They have to be clones of each other. So the mama bacteria will double the DNA, grow in size, and split in half. And most bacteria can do binary fission about once every 20 minutes. So it doesn't take long for uh, bacteria to multiply and spread and move throughout the environment. Now, I don't care for the way that this is stated. People will talk about how bacteria can sexually reproduce, and that's not really what happens. When you have sexual reproduction, you have an egg and a sperm, they come together and they make a brand new individual. In the case of conjugation, conjugation is where bacteria have the ability to attach to each other and swap pieces of DNA. So they're not making an offspring. So technically it's not really reproduction in my mind, but you're still making, it's allowing for genetic variation. So these two bacteria come together and they kind of swap genetic material and you're creating a different bacteria because it's got different DNA in it, but you're not creating a third bacteria. So this is what allows for genetic variation. Now, you guys might've heard of the mummy's curse. Okay. When people first, discovered the tombs of the pharaohs a few weeks later a lot of them got really really sick and died and back then they thought it was a curse but what we probably what we know probably happened was they breathed in some bacteria that hadn't been breathed in in hundreds to thousands of years because bacteria have the ability to form a shell around themselves and that shell is what's called an endospore when bacteria realize that their environment is changing they can form this hard shell this is why we have to be real careful with, for example, we find creatures that have been frozen in ice for hundreds to thousands of years. We have to be real careful because they might have bacteria on their skin that we haven't seen as humans. The, those bacteria don't exist today. And so as we defrost them, we begin to breathe in this bacteria. It can cause serious, serious, serious health problems. And so this endospore is a structure encasing the bacteria. It helps keep it from drying out. It protects it from temperatures. And only sterilization will kill it. So, you know, you might rinse your dishes off in the sink. Well, all you're doing is you're washing the food off. Any bacteria is still on the plate. That's why we have a dishwasher. We have to have that really, really hot water because that really, really hot water will break down the chemicals in the cell wall. And so the bacteria, water can rush into the bacteria and the bacteria can explode and it kills the bacteria. I mentioned antibiotics before. Antibiotics are for bacteria. And the very first antibiotic ever discovered was penicillin, and it was discovered by Alexander Fleming. And I, I mentioned it's, it's a fungus, it's a type of bread mold. And you can see in this picture here how you've got the squiggly lines. That's where they took a Q-tip and it was covered with bacteria. And you see the bacteria growing. And you see that white circle, that's the fungus. And you can see that around the fungus, no bacteria are growing. So the fungus creates a chemical and that chemical spreads and these holes in the cell wall of the bacteria and it causes the bacteria to explode. The problem is we've killed most bacteria that penicillin is gonna kill. Um, so there's a lot of super bugs out there. They're, we just don't have antibiotics to kill them anymore because they've adapted through mutations. They just say, oh, I'm gonna change my cell wall so I don't get bothered by this antibiotic. They just happen to be made with a mutation and the drugs we have now doesn't affect the chemicals in their cell walls. So when we talk about bacteria, Beware, the reason bacteria make us sick is they're living. They're going to give off waste products just like we do. Yeah. We urinate, you know, we have fecal material, we have gaseous waste products we breathe out. Well, bacteria are going to give off gas products or waste products just like we do. The problem is most of their waste products are poisonous to our cells, and that's what a toxin is. 
And so a classic example is the botulism disease. It's what people, it's basically true, real, serious food poisoning. And, you know, I remember my grandparents would can foods. I don't never really understood why it was called canning when you put it in glass bottles. But you know, these type of glass bottles have those pop tops. Well, before we would open a brand new bottle of preserves or peaches or green beans or whatever, if that pop had, if that top had popped up, don't open it because there was a bacteria inside of it and the bacteria has formed gaseous waste products and it's filling up that glass bottle and it's popped that top. My, you know, people make fun of me when I go to the grocery store, I'll feel, I'll feel a can. You can tell if a can has been dropped on the ground, but I'll like kind of run my hands along a can because if the can feels swollen, it's possible that there's a bacteria inside of it, it's given off gas and that's causing it to swell. Everybody in this room has probably had tetanus shot. Okay. Tetanus is a um, bacterial infection where the bacteria lives in rusty products. And well, our blood is made from rust. It's got iron, it's red, it's metallic. And this bacteria gets into the rusty portions of our blood and thrives. Well, it's gonna pee just like we do but it pees a toxin and that toxin infects our nerve cells. But not all bacteria are bad. Again, some bacteria are used to decompose dead material. We wouldn't, you know, we'd have thousands of years of dead stuff packed on top of each other. Um, some bacteria are what we call nitrogen fixers. You have to have nitrogen to make DNA. Your nitrogen bases, A's, G's, T's, and C's. And the atmosphere is 78% oxygen, or excuse me, about 78% nitrogen. The problem is nitrogen as a gas is poisonous to most creatures. So right now you're breathing in nitrogen, but you turn around and you breathe it right back out. But you have to have nitrogen to make DNA and RNA. Well, most of our nitrogen comes from the foods we eat. So we eat food products, we take the nitrogen from the food products in order to make our DNA and our RNA. Well, plants don't eat. So a lot of plants have a relationship, a mutualistic relationship with bacteria and the bacteria lives in their roots. And the bacteria can breathe in nitrogen and it pees just like we do. When you pee, you pee out nitrogenous waste products. You pee out waste products left over from nitrogen. And so when it, you know, just think of it as peeing, this liquid nitrogen comes out and mixes with the soil. And now when the plant absorbs the water, it can absorb that nitrogen with it. And also in the case of bacteria, we mentioned how bacteria can be used to make things like cheeses. It can be used to make sourdough bread. We use bacteria actually to make insulin. And we'll talk about that when we do the biotech. There's uh, two men who live, I wanna say Oregon, who are now multimillionaires because they are the first people ever to patent a man-made bacteria. And that bacteria cleans up oil spills. You know, back in the day, you've all seen the, the Dawn commercials where they're cleaning the oil off of these creatures. Well, it's still soap, it's still a waste product. I can't take a bunch of soap and just dump it in the ocean. Well, these gentlemen created a freeze-dried type of bacteria that a plane can fly overhead, drop that bacteria, and when it mixes with the water, it wakes up and it eats the oil. And when the oil's gone, 